Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkies listeners, Molly here. Today, Vera and I interviewed Dr. Kirsten Moberg. But first, I wanted to remind you that Clarissa and I are officially launching a business together. Sweet Sobriety is a -a one-of-a-kind online coaching community and connection platform for those seeking an improved relationship with self, food, and body. While we're still in the process of developing all of our services, we're happy to share our Surviving the Holidays workshop with Bethany Mazaru that begins Wednesday, November 16th. In this very practical workshop, you will create your own personalized game plan for upcoming holidays over four weeks and learn what makes the holidays so challenging. Set your own intention. Make a detailed plan that works for you. Learn about self-care and integrate it into your plan. Learn about and plan your boundaries for the holidays. Leverage any food slips and glean learnings from your own post-holiday debrief to propel you forward. What you'll get, a sweet sobriety holiday plan template, guidance to completing your plan via four video modules to watch at your own pace, and four one-hour live support sessions, one per week for those joining in November 2022. Register by going to sweetsobriety.ca or by checking the show notes for the website link. All right, let me get to our guest today, Dr. Moberg. Dr. Moberg got her MD and a PhD in pharmacology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. She's been employed as a full-time professor of physiology at the University of Agriculture in Uppsala, Sweden. She has worked with research linked to the physiology of labor and breastfeeding for more than 30 years. The focus of the research has been on the role of oxytocin and sensory stimulation, in particular stimulation of cutaneous sensory nerves during labor, skin-to-skin contact after birth, and breastfeeding. She's worked with animal experiments and also studies involving humans. She has studied the physiological mechanisms involved in birth and breastfeeding and also short and long-term physiological and behavioral maternal adaptations induced during birth and breastfeeding. She's also working with the role of oxytocin during human-animal interaction and in menopausal women. So today in this episode, we hear Dr. Moberg's personal and professional journey. What is oxytocin? The satiety system volume, comfort, and emotional eating, the anti-stress system, what ultra-processed foods are doing to humans, grazing, oxytocin deficiency syndrome, pharmacological interventions, raising oxytocin, fasting, what's next, and our signature question. Welcome, Dr. Moberg. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast, and my name is Dr. Vera Tarman. I am your co-host today, along with Molly Painchuk. Today, we are speaking with Swedish researcher, Dr. Kirsten Unas Moberg. That's the Americanized version of that name. Dr. Moberg Mm -hmm. is a medical specialist in women's health and is a pioneer in the research about oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone of love and well-being. And Dr. Moberg is one of the first researchers to explore the behavioral, psychological, and physical implications of oxytocin during birth, breastfeeding, and menopause. Dr. Moberg is author of over 400 scientific articles, as well as the books, The Oxytocin Factor, Tapping the Hormone of Calm, Love, and Healing, The Hormone of Closeness, The Role of Oxytocin in Relationships, Oxytocin, The Biological Guide to Motherhood, Attachment to Pets, I like that one, see my <laughs> um, and uh, Why Oxytocin Matters. We at Food Junkies are especially interested to know the effects of oxytocin on feeding, overeating, and the role it may play in food addiction and recovery. So welcome, Dr. Moberg. Thank you. Thank you. This is really going to be, I hope, a very interesting talk because I sort of uh, find this topic so important. And also, as I will come back to, I think that the, the physiological aspects that I will try to bring to this Mm. meeting have a little bit come into the background. Okay, it's as great. If people have forgotten it. Yeah. 
we're not going to let people forget because th this I I think this is a super interesting oh well I guess a neglected hormone mm -hmm. or any mm -hmm. chemical behind eating so we're mm -hmm. not going to let that happen but before we get into the science of that and the clinical implications would you mind telling us a bit of your personal journey how did you get from being a a physician working in women's health into specifically the study and uh, research of oxytocin what got you interested well it's actually I mean, it's it's a long story, and there are of course, always parallel explanations. <laughs> but I think one of the most important thing is that I I had two children, and then ten years in between, and two more children, mm -hmm. and I sort of realized that very similar things happened. You know, you changed in a very you know similar way during each pregnancy, and I had been told that everything is psychological. You know. But now I understood that this is not true. There are some very basic, I would say, physiological things that go on during labor and birth and breastfeeding and, and, and having a baby, which are there to help mothers, you know, even if they don't know it. And then I had some very nice neighbors who were mid happened to be midwives. And then I actually... Is we, we did show that each time a mother is breastfeeding, her entire GI tract is activated. It is as if she's eating herself. And I thought that was very logical because she, you know, if you want to give out energy, which you do during breastfeeding, there are probably physiological mechanisms that will sort of also regulate your intake. So actually, breastfeeding is a time when you are more hungry. Than usual because you need you need to eat more yeah, to so compensate you, for for everything that you give out so i started you, to sorry, yeah. can you explain what you meant you said that uh, you notice that women tend to eat you, you, say the phrase again and, and sort of just explain what you mean by that it's very interesting yeah because when you produce milk during breastfeeding yeah i would say you lose a lot of calories in a sense which is you know ex which is not which you don't do in during ordinary conditions. And then I thought that it would be very logical that at the same time a balancing system that would ensure that the mother, you know, takes in more calories because to compensate for this loss. And normally in physiology you see this balance between, you know, energy being given out and energy being taken in. So I guess there should be some kind of a saving system being activated at the same time as you are actually giving out. And then I started to explore what happened during breastfeeding. And actually, it was clear that each time, as I said, the mother was eating, she activated insulin, she activated, you know, the hormones that produce gastric acid, you know, to train the stomach. But she also changed her metabolism. And the system that's related to satiety was a little bit downregulated. Now, I was very fascinated by this. And then I was invited, this is crazy, to a conference in California, which was actually held by the brother or the guy who created McDonald's. Because So I was invited to a farm, you know, with, say, 20 other scientists, and we were supposed to talk to each other for, for a week you know, exchanged ideas and things. And I presented my data on, you know, the change function in the in the gut. And then suddenly somebody raised his hand and said, are you sure you're not looking at oxytocin? And I thought the guy is crazy. Uh. Doesn't, can't he see that I'm working with insulin and these hormones that are controlled by the vagal nerve? And then I got it. And then I suddenly understood that oxytocin is not just, you know, a substance that's secreted into the circulation. It, at the same time, you have activation of nerves within the brain that help adapt physiological and also behavioral functions when oxytocin is secreted. So then I went back to Stockholm, and since then I've been working with oxytocin. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. So and and, and so your discovery that uh, when a woman is breastfeeding, she basically eat, the system regulates in such a way that she eats more. That carried you further. Yeah. So, so yeah. Let, let's backtrack and just ask uh, or, or tell our listeners what is oxytocin and how like what's the oxytocin system and 
what are its various functions? Mm -hmm. Well, Primary. I think most people have heard the term oxytocin, and it is a well-known su supposed hormone that helps with labor and birth. And it's, you know, it's, it was identified 100 years ago, and it's been used clinically to augment labor, you know, for 50 or 60 years. Now, what was not known at that time is that if you look at the area of production in the brain, the hypothalamus, you can see how neurons that contain oxytocin go down into the pituitary to release oxytocin into the circulation. But you can also see a lot of neurons within the brain that actually project areas, all important, I would say, areas, including those regulating appetite, regulating energy metabolism, regulating stress levels, you know, all of these important things, anxiety and all things. And then it was obvious that these nerves were very, very sort of important to sort of balance what was happening when oxytocin was being secreted into the to the to the to the blood. Then somebody then it was also, you know, some smart people understood that you can't have a hormone that promotes birth and and breastfeeding without also adapting the mother to motherhood. And then they started to find these social effects of oxytocin. It was, you know, causing maternity and maternal behavior and things. And then this, and I started to, do, to work with the physiology and found that oxytocin was extremely stress-reducing in males and females, can, in can young I, and old. Can yeah. I just, uh, I, if, I, if, you, if I can, can I just stop you and, and just explain a couple of things? Very good, our, very good. Some of our listeners who may not know. So, so the, the relationship between breastfeeding and maternal, like the oxytocin release, is that it's the oxytocin hormone that, that stimulates breast milk production. And it's yeah. also the, uh, uh, the uh, hormone that stimulates a uh, vaginal contraction uh, for birth. The, so the uterine contractions, yes, it, yes, yes. It, it, yeah. right, I'm sorry, uterine contractions, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that which we all know happens, that's thanks to oxytocin. And, that, and, yeah. then, and that's hormonal impact. But you mm. also said that it's, it's mm. about going back to the brain, so there's a neurochemical impact as well. Yeah, neurotransmitter, yeah. whatever you call it. Yeah, I just want to I want to yeah. clarify that because our, our readers, our, our listeners know about this stuff just to link to the information that we already have. Okay, go forward. Very now. good, very good. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we started to work with these other effects, which were more basic in a sense, because they have really nothing to do with labor, birth or breastfeeding. They're more general. And mm. it started to come out that oxytocin was a hormone that stimulated social interaction in everybody, you know, in males and females, and also in, in uh, very small babies and in, in old people. And that it was extremely potent uh, stress inhibition, you know. So mm -hmm. it decreases the activity, you know, it decreases cortisol levels, it decreases blood pressure, you know, all these things. So it's a very, very, I would say it, it was a hidden system. It wasn't seen because it's an antagonist to what we really notice, and that is being activated and stressed. But behind the scenes, we have this oxytocin in the brain that all the time make us feel better, calm down a bit, feel less pain, and also uh, be less stressed in many ways. And in that aspect, I think, uh, food, food intake is one of the important consequences because yeah. when you feel good, yeah. you don't eat so much. Before, and you, we get, you, if, before we get to the food, let's just backtrack about just the role of oxytocin because there's a lot of information on what you said. You, one of the mm -hmm. things you said is that men have it. So how can men have it? Because men don't breastfeed, they don't deliver babies. Like where is that coming from? And then you mentioned babies. Like how is that? What's the biological well, purpose of, of it in, the, in those I things? think we have to, it's a very important question because I think we have to sort of increase the role of oxytocin to, mm. a, I would say, a reproductive hormone or a hormone promoting life. And that's not restricted to women. It's just that breastfeeding and birth happens to be major events, you know, reproductive events. But we are living all the time. Babies are growing and we, we have this oxytocin system all the time helping us to, I would say, have a better life and to survive and to be able to yeah, 
endure life, I would say. So it's it's a very, very basic system. And you can find it in fish and birds and even oh down God, to yes. even down to earthworms and things. You can you, you find oxytocin like systems, you know, and, and peptides, which then make the them produce eggs and 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 uh, that is also which is a kind of reproduction but at the same time it seems that also in very primitive animals oxytocin has effects on the social behavior you know closeness versus not so it's not it's nothing to do really with pregnancy or or, or labor or birth it's much broader and much deeper Okay, so you were saying that it has something to do with feeding. Can you elaborate more on that, on our satiety and our hunger? Well, how oxytocin I, would, I, I, I would say that oxytocin is a very, very uh, important hormone in the sense that it, I tell you, it, it has something to do with, with survival, so to say. And one aspect of, of this is what we call, as I said, you, you, you can be hungry, of course, but you also have a satiety system. And this is very clear in the GI tract. You have hormones that promote, I would say, hunger. And I would also say the, the, um, the metabolism linked to that. That's high insulin levels, you know, to take the energy out of the food, to store everything. But we also have a satiety system, which kicks in a little bit later. When you have food in the stomach, it sort of passes down. And the further down you come in the gut, the more you have of the uh, satiety systems. And the satiety system is in two ways linked to appetite. Because actually, when you eat, you have this release of, for example, the hormone cholecystokinin, which through the vagal nerve stimulates oxytocin which makes you feel well and, you know, and then you, and also you, it is sort of makes you less hungry and you can also go vice versa. So with high oxytocin levels, you have more cholecystokinin. So this system becomes more efficient. Is, so you can this, shift is what, it. Is this what's meant by increasing the vagal tone? Is this, is this the same thing that we're the talking vagal about? Tone, the vagal tone is actually, I would say, has two two possible effects. It can actually stimulate hunger too, but it can also stimulate satiety. So I think it depends on, I mean, your blood sugar would increase, if you have low blood sugar, very, you would stimulate the vagal nerve, the aspects that would facilitate food intake. But the, the, the other one is stimulating satiety and the way that you absorb food, increase your temperature production, you get rid of the calories, so I think there is a balance somewhere in our brains. And some people have a little bit more, you know, are a bit more active in their yeah. let, let, let's hold hunger on. state. Yeah, let's hold on that because I think I, I want to, uh, for sure we want to pursue that. Where does leptin fit into this story? Because I use leptin, 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 leptin is a hormone. L- yeah, leptin is, a, is, is another satiety hormone, which is produced in, in fat tissue mainly, and you have it in some nerves. I would say it runs in parallel with okay. cholecystokinin. And, but the, the thing with the cholecystokinin, that it is located in the gut. So you can, you can measure it in, you know, in response to a food intake, mm-hmm. whereas leptin is, has another time curve. Such as, but it's part of the same system, so they are all interconnected. And I would say these systems, you know, the satiety system is also linked to the dopamine system. Right. Oh, my so gosh. You, Another thing we want to talk about. But before, yeah, so you so, have, so, it, it's, yeah. it's a basic satiety system. It wouldn't just give you sort of, you know, satiety from food. It would at the same time make you feel well. Mm-hmm. So there are oxytocin connections to the dopamine producing areas, which will then make you, you know, feel good and, 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 and uh, rewarded, I would say. Okay, so, so just, to, just to summarize here, so, so the satiety system is driven by both leptin and also the C, CCK. Um, no, or yeah. involves, I would say, involves. Yeah, okay. it's, it's driven, it's, it's connected, yeah. It's connected. And, then with that, and with that is an abundance or a production of oxytocin, which then gives that feeling of well-being after a full... Yeah, meal. yeah, it, it, it's, it's part of a big, I would say, I wouldn't say reflex, but an, an integrated response. You feel 
the satiety with CCK and leptin, and then in addition, you have the well-being. And yeah. all of this can actually be, be induced by by uh, oxytocin, because oxytocin would connect to all these systems. So it might that be an explanation? I, we're kind of jumping ahead here. I know, Molly, because you wanted to ask about this, but could this be an explanation for people who eat a lot of volume because they want that sense of fullness? Or maybe I they think can't so. otherwise get it? Can you elaborate on that? Because that's like, we are really trying to find what is the yeah. fundamental foundation of volume addiction. And could this you be know, Venue. In very very good question because I think that uh, if you if you look at the activation of the afferent vagal nerves, it's it's a it's two things add to this. One is actually the presence of calories. The other thing is pressure, and of course volume is the pressure component. So yeah. I would say that in some people the satiety system may be a little bit weaker. You see, you need a little bit more to activate it. And that would be the volume, you see. But yeah. still, I think that you could, by central mechanism, perhaps by increasing your oxytocin system here, you might reduce a little bit the need for this mm. enormous uh, extra tension or pressure that you cause by by a high volume. Right. But is so, it okay, is it bidirectional ahead. though? I mean, could if if what we're actually seeking with that volume piece of the food is satiety, is oxytocin, right? Some of those things like oxytocin, serotonin, whatever. Then can we really call it addiction? I mean, can we be addicted to oxytocin? Can we, if, if we're seeking it, isn't it because we need it? I think it's it's a very, very intelligent question. And I think that, that addiction has a biological root in this sense that I think we need satiety. I mean, just like we have, you know, bondings to other individuals where we know oxytocin plays an important part. We have, I think that food addiction is a bit of, of an increased bonding. It's too strong, you know, belief. because there is also this, as you say, oxytocin released by food intake, just mm -hmm. as it is by touching. And, and But somehow the intensity of the system that's linked to the gastrointestinal tract is stronger in some individuals. That might be genetic, we don't know. Mm -hmm. It might be consequences, I'm sure, by periods of too little food intake, you know, because then you, I told you, I talked about this balance between yeah. the part that initiates hunger and the one that initiates satiety. This is a critical balance for life. And I think that if there is a period, it might be during pregnancy, it might be any time, there is too little calories, like during a war or, you know, there might be an activation of the hunger system, which is the ratio becomes a little bit disturbed. And then, of course, there will be, uh, you know, it's easier to, to eat more. I think we see this in some people who has been on a diet, for example, that yeah. it, it's definitely not just, it's not the same thing just to stop eating then, because not only could, you know, the hunger be bigger, you also metabolize the, the energy a little bit less for a while, which is part of what I'm saying is this, it is life-saving in, in a very primitive way, yeah. that if, if the body considers food intake to be the norm, you know, in the world, you'd better put on or or, or, or or a pattern that makes you eat a little bit more. Now, can, can I just I just backtrack a bit? Because I want to really spell this out. I, I just find this so fascinating. So that a person who it, it would identify as being a volume addict would, will probably say, or, or, or this, this theoretical premise here is that the, it's not so much the stretch receptors, but the pressure drives the oxytocin, which gives them that feeling of contentment. Yes? Yeah, yeah, and, but and it's okay. more difficult. It's it's more difficult to trigger in those, and therefore they need they need more volume. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and 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 those are the people who try to control volume, maybe by restricting. And they will often say, "It's not that I'm not. I I want pleasure for my food. I want comfort." And, exactly. and some people will say they feel deprived. I personally have used the word. I feel deprived as if I'm motherless. Uh, I, yeah. I, when I don't eat food, I feel like my mother isn't there, and like it, it, yeah. it feels like a. But it, it's, it's a perfect, perfect yeah. analogy because yeah. it's it's related yeah. to the sense of touch. 
Oh and, and so it's, it's actually coming to very similar places in the brain. And in some cases, you get more from the stomach and in some places, in some instances, you get more from, from the skin. But somehow the, the balance between these two inputs seem uh-huh. to vary between some people. But yes. it is basically the same mechanism. So yes. it's about comfort, feeling calm, allowing yourself to rest and, yeah. and and being and well being. It's not it's not pleasure really. Yeah. It, it's more keeping the balance. And, and wouldn't it make sense that the people who will will be the most susceptible? You mentioned genetics, but wouldn't it also be people who have had adverse childhood experiences? Absolutely, who develop a good maternal bond when they were children. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. So this is also something that really hasn't been explored. I think, but knowing what I have from yeah. my sort of. I, I know physiology very well. You know, before I started yeah. working with oxytocin, I had worked with GI physiology for 10 years and stimulated nerves and things. So I think that it's, as you say, I, having, you know, a very good upbringing, you learn to use these, these the effect of touch fibers become more important. Mm-hmm. And then you reduce the input, impact of, of, you know, of the, of the GI tract. But if you don't have it, there is always this last way of feeling comfort, and that's eating. We yeah. all have it, but in some people, it stays as more important. I mean, Molly, wouldn't you wouldn't you um, confirm that clinically that the yeah. those pretty hardcore food addicts have usually some kind of background where there's deprivation? Oh, definitely. I mean, not all, but. I mean, there are always going to be exceptions to the rule, but absolutely. And I think, you know, as you were explaining that, you know, my question had been, you know, is volume eating or eating for that, again, for Mm -hmm. that comfort, for that, is it essentially, Mm -hmm. I mean, this label that we hear a lot, emotional eating, Mm -hmm. is that what it is? I think it is. It's a way of stabilizing, uh, uh, you know, this very basic hypothalamic system, which is the stress system versus the... I would call it the oxytocinergic or the anti-stress system. And that's it's a little bit more than just stress. It's it's the well-being, the comfort, whereas the other one is feeling stressed and empty and all these things. And and it's it's a way of balancing that out. And and then of course you have after a while it gets conditioned and you go on and you do things because it's 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 suddenly in the walls, so to say. So I think all everything around feeding is easily conditioned. But is it then, new? Like, is this phenomenon new or is this like bio? I mean, is this our wiring? Yeah, I think like it's our wiring. Oh, okay. It's our wiring. So it's not but, new to today's modern food environment. No, okay. no. I'm yeah. just sure that every time has its triggers and we don't have this extreme. I mean, look at hunters and gatherers. There must have been periods when there was very little berries or mushrooms, and then they would eat whatever, you know, when they would fill themselves with, you know, anything. So I, it's a very, very old system. But then, of course, depending on which society we live in, the triggers will differ. And, yeah. and, in, and, and, uh, and that, as you say, it might be experienced to, to, as you say, bad experience during your childhood, which will also change exactly this balance where the stress system, I would say, becomes too strong and, and the efficiency of this anti-stress system too yeah. weak. And then there is this way of, of uh, compensating for this. And also these people are sometimes a little bit afraid, of course, of social contact. So again, you have this, this, this ultimate, you know, source. Yeah. And, so, and, so, but so what, mm-hmm. what, what, what you've described here is kind of the hormonal deregulation and really what you, the body's trying to do is regulate. And, 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 and yeah. Molly, I would just add to that, that the addiction part is when the, it, the wiring becomes fused in a particular way and then causes all sorts of havoc. So the, yeah. I, in, this, in this context, it seems like the hormonal starts and then the uh, addiction, the pattern behavior causes the, yeah. the well, yeah. And then that's extremely hard to break, which we should talk about. That's treatment. Yeah, um, yeah. But before we get to that, uh, so in today, so Molly, you were suggesting the processed food industry. How does that add to the, uh, uh, what's the, what's, what is it doing to us in this generation? I think there must be some kind of, of uh, uh, the processed food. I can't say exactly how, but it must be that this system is not actively activating this satiety system in the way it should. You know, it is linked. We know that in, in, basic physiology, what actually stimulates 
the CC system, which is, you know, the first the first branch of the of we call this well-being system. It's actually proteins and and it is some types of fat. Proteins so and fat, yeah. If if you start if you start to stop to eating these aspects, you you will will not have any activation of this of of this system. Actually, if we look from this basic point of view, eating a lot of carbohydrates even might shift the balance towards a stress dominance. Yeah. You know, because it's meant to feed you when you are out being active or or fighting or or whatever. So it's so. And then I think that the food that we create today somehow doesn't really fully activate this system. I can't really say why, but well, you, there might just, be some modifications. Let, of the, let me of just the, add to that. Like the, what happens is that the food industry or the processed food d- promises, it, it, it gives the big promise, but it doesn't deliver. And you've just hmm. explained how it doesn't deliver because it doesn't activate the satiety system. There's there's not enough protein. There's not enough fats. It's mainly mm-hmm. carbohydrates. Exactly. Gives, exactly. gives the promise high dopamine, which is promise, but no delivery. Uh, no, no, because it doesn't activate this system and then you yeah. won't have it. And possibly, possibly they might add a few things that might even activate, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the, the hunger in the mouth, so to say, the, you know, that the craving or, or the, the interest in food, which will be linked to the uh, hunger system, to that aspect. So I think. It, they are cheating us in two ways mm-hmm. by increasing the the wish to eat it because it tastes so good, which is not linked to the satiety because at the same time it fails to activate this aspect of the GI tract. Yeah. Okay. So so we were talking about volume. What about just simply grazing throughout the day, just eating all the time? Doesn't that also uh, that must somehow stimulate the vagal tone? Stimulate. Yeah. The I I don't think you. I think you by doing that. You will feed the hunger system, you know, by, yes. by, because a while after eating, you, you still, you know, what's the French word that appetite comes while you are eating, so to say. And if you don't eat enough or have this pressure and this amount of calories, you won't break, you know, the hunger system enough. And then, so I think that this eating, you know, small amounts all the time is, is very dangerous because you never get into the, uh, satiety system because you need some kind of volume then and also the carbohydrate no sorry the proteins and the fat to activate that so it's always this balance so food containing protein and and fat will have a much bigger chance of sort of reverting the effect of this system to the inhibitory or calming or satiety side so now, now, one of the things that you, we st- you kind of uh, you, you haven't brought it out, but you've been showing it by you know touching yourself and stuff. How do we uh-huh. get oxytocin beside just eating? So one of the ways is suckling, obviously, because that's breastfeeding. Well, could mm-hmm. the fact that some of the foods that we eat are so mouth focused, uh, could that be in a way uh, uh, another way that people are trying to get that oxytocin by the chewing and the munching? Almost it like can a- be, but I, I don't think it's so efficient because no, 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 no. because I think it, it it's I I definitely think so that it is a way of but it it doesn't give the full effect. No. It stays with a more proximal effect, which is actually wanting more. It's not sort of breaking the wish to eat because then you need to get further down and have more solid things. I don't think it it's enough with a lot of cabbage either. I think you actually need. Uh-huh need the, the calories to break this. There are some very interesting studies. There is some Japanese people who have worked with the oxytocin system and they have found that you can actually, by increasing the activity of the oxytocin system in the brain, they give more oxytocin. They can see mm. how the function of the, of the, of the GI tract normalizes, you know, you don't get this, uh, there is often you this this uh, retention in the stomach that you don't, it doesn't pass as quickly, which is also probably experienced as unpleasant. Uh-huh. So you normalize the transit of food and most likely also the balance between what we call hunger and, and, and satiety. So we are mixing or fiddling around with a very, very basic system that wasn't, I mean, in, in when these systems were created, we didn't have these problems, did we? I mean, we had to eat what we got. 
Yes. And that was some food, some proteins from time to time. And, and, and then it was what, what the forest would offer you. Yes. Now, now, do you believe in, let's now just move to the next concept of oxytocin deficiency syndrome. Do you believe that such a thing exists? There are a yes, I do. I do. I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I really do. And because I'm talking about this balance, you know, yes. and, and we have talked about hyperactivity in the stress system, which, of course, will be negative for the oxytocin because there is, an, there is an, a mutual inhibition of these systems. But one thing is to have too much stress. The other negative thing is to have too little effect in the anti-stress or the oxytocin system. Mm. You know, these two, because that will also change the balance in, in favor of, of call it stress or not feeling so good. And that in turn, we know, may be caused by, I'm sure there is a genetic component because we have looked at the oxytocin levels in breastfeeding mothers and there are some who have high levels and some who have low levels. That's mm-hmm. one aspect. But we also know that if you're exposed to severe stress, you will also downregulate the oxytocin levels. And it seems as if early childhood stress Mm. seemed to lower these oxytocin levels permanently. I have seen data showing that it is possible to reverse these effects a little bit. Because you have, a, because if you can get rid of that, you know, cyst, the stress or the noradrenergic mechanism, whatever that inhibits, yeah. it's it's still there. It's still there, and that's why we sometimes see that people who have problems with humans, they can get a lot of oxytocin by dogs because you know they are not uh-huh. imprinted imprinted in the negative uh, experience somehow. Now the other thing is that I also think that you need to train. The oxytocin system. It's like a newborn baby. In order to have this oxytocin system being activated, you need the stroking, the touch, you know, the friendliness, the contact, because each time you will activate the oxytocin a bit. And, and the maternal gaze. Long, the, maternal you know, the maternal gaze. gaze. Yes. And when you get these things repeatedly, you get to a higher level, so to say. So it's it's actually, you can have a lack of stimulation and you can have an inhibition by stress. There are a few studies uh, which show that women who have uh, some, uh, you know, problems with their uh, mental, uh, you know, w- 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 too angry or too... Or postpartum well control. Not really. What okay. what do we call them? You know, these are a little bit too impulsive and, and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Border, borderline personality. Exactly. Yeah. They have lower oxytocins and it correlates with neglect, you see? Yes. So, because so what happens might... is they, they they become hypersensitive to touch because they don't they haven't trained their system to absorb yeah. the touch or to absorb no, they can't connection. they can't trigger the satiety effect on yes. it. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Right. So it might be a little bit of a, you know, genetic component, but definitely this is the case. And so what, I think what, that... Can I, let me just say, what about a, a non-vaginal, like a C-section, like a non-vaginal delivery? Mm-hmm. There is no oxytocin that's being introduced initially to baby. What about... That's a major mega question, because okay. that's actually what... So I'm part of some studies now where we are huh. exploring this. So my... But you also lose the cortisol, you know. So a C-section mm. takes away activation both of the cortisol, which helps mature organs and things, and of the oxytocin. So mm. it might be that these, these individuals start at a lower level somehow. And, mm. and nobody thought that these things could have long-term effects. But in, in the level, you know, at the population level, I'm sure they will find something that these systems are not fully activated or, you know, a little bit... Uh, dysregulated Could, so that might fed, be something yeah what mm-hmm. about bottle fed infants uh, infants that don't get uh, breast milk and, and that whole process could that be another mm-hmm. predisposition yes it's and not only that not yeah. only that because the breastfeeding baby mm-hmm. does doesn't yeah she or he gets the milk with a lot of good fats and proteins but mm-hmm. they also at the same time yeah get the the closeness and they suckle so the yes. stimulus suckling is very good at activating the CCK. So you train the CCK system much better if you have to really suckle all the time. So okay. it's it's actually depriving the babies not only of the perfect milk, it's also 
it's it's also a, I would say an aberrant training of the autonomic nervous system, yes. and we know that these babies are at risk for obesity and also for a higher BMI, aren't they? So it's it's not only the milk. I think it's also the process of you know swallowing and suckling, which right. is which is good for you. Okay. Now, now in line with the oxytocin deficiency syndrome, one of the people that writes about that, and I'd like your opinion, is William Davis, Doctor Davis, who says that it's a gut bacteria deficiency, and that he recommends actually Lactobacillus reuteri. I don't know. Mm. I'm saying that properly, but anyway, mm-hmm. uh, we just need to feed particular gut, and that that will produce more oxytocin. What's your opinion about that? I know that there are some links between uh, lactobacilli and oxytocin release, but that's just part of the story. It's yes. it's it's one aspect that you can and that's been known for long that that uh, lactobacilli would enhance the activity in the serotonin system and everything. But it's not the whole story. It's part of it. It's part of it. And of course, if you want to trigger your system, you should maybe use several, many ways. Okay. And the lactobacillus, but I don't think it will uh, do the, do everything. But you can, it's not a negative thing to use it. Okay. Uh, and, and then the other thing about the oxytocin deficiency is that another a doctor, Carolyn Davis, actually who is in a, in a Ontario, Canada, talked to, uh-huh. she actually found research to link oxytocin deficiency with an increase in addictive eating. Uh, so she doesn't explain the causation, just that there is an association between the two, which is what yeah. you've been saying as well. That's exactly what I'm saying, that you have an imbalance then in, 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 in the satiety part of the system is a bit weakened. Yes. And and then then of course you will have more the risk of eating more if there is a reason for it will increase and then we have this very very un, un, unfortunate link to conditioning or or to because food intake you know yeah. it's meant to be extremely aversive if you eat, you can you can get you know if if you eat something that's not good you you don't want it anymore because it's dangerous and of course we have the same risk of 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 uh, positive reinforcement and look at Pavlov. Pavlov is all of this. I think Pavlov's work is absolutely fantastic with his cephalic face, you know, looking at, listening to something will immediately trigger the gastric acid and all these things, which is the proximal part, the hunger system. Mm-hmm. You can never trigger the satiety system as easily just by looking at food. Of course, it triggers the hunger oh, aspect. Isn't that be nice? Don't eh? you think? Yeah. 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 So what's the so, role of dopamine? It seems like dopamine would fit into this conversation. Yeah. So dopamine, to... dopamine definitely is, is the core, I would say, in the, in the should we call it the center for well-being or, or, or feeling good. But the dopamine system has many inputs. One of those is oxytocin. So one of these nerves go from uh, from the you know areas in the hypothalamus to the striatum to the nucleus accumbens when you eat. So it's 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 actually a system including well being and and satiety and and sedation or you know calming down, which is also part of something that's very good. And so I think it belongs together as a very basic system linked to relaxation, feeling good, you know, yeah. okay, so, uh, being so, allowed to rest. And, so, and, so, and, we, sorry. so we have a, a client that comes in and it's clear that they're, they're, they're disordered. Maybe they've had a history of uh, maternal deprivation or some kind of deprivation uh, as a child. Now they're eating in a disordered way. What's the treatment? You said that we can learn to train our oxytocin system to go right or wrong. Can we mm-hmm. retrain it? Can, can we, once we see that there's a person with a problem, what do we do? Is there something you can I, th- do? I think, well, I haven't worked with this, but if I sort of yes, we'll try to about. understand it from my from my physiological knowledge or, or picture on this, of course, th- there must be some kind of uh, getting rid of, of these daily triggers, you know, whatever, if it's something you eat or if something you are, and probably having very sort of regular food intake and increase the, the, the amount of protein and fat, not be afraid of the fat. And then I think that to increase the amount of oxytocin from the skin, swimming, taking a hot bath, mm. you know, all of these things that make you feel contact from the outside will sort of, you know, dampen the, the influence of these systems. So I think you can recondition if you really work 
on these things. But then I can also understand that these people will be a little bit super sensitive to the triggers of hunger, that is hypoglycemia. Perhaps yeah. you should never be hungry. You should never be hungry. Now, perhaps you should not drink these, uh, I would say, sugar, you know, drinks with uh, artificial sugar because the sweetness will activate insulin release. And with insulin, you will get... I and mean, people always talk about insulin and, and uh, insulin resistance. That's not the whole aspect. Before you have that, insulin causes hypoglycemia. Yeah. And that's, mm-hmm. that's a trigger of eating. That's a trigger of eating. Mm-hmm. So I think it's about breaking habits and increasing input from other aspects of the skin or the surface. Yeah, so not not to sound flippant, but if a person is hypersensitive uh, and doesn't really know how to relate to people, getting a pet, getting two pets, would probably Absolutely. be helpful. Perfect. Go swimming, you know, yeah. be in the sun and, and get this feeling of, of being held or touched. doesn't need to be a person. It could be physical, you know, like warmth and, 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 and uh, I think like pressure, like when you're swimming, I think is excellent, really. Uh-huh. And, and, and that increase in oxytocin tone, yeah. as it were, will, yeah. will give a sense of satiety even without the eating. Yeah, well-being. And, uh, yeah, because yes, it well-being. sort of changes the balance in this a bit towards, you know, it's the opposite of this feeling of not being connected, not feeling as if you belong anywhere or being empty. So it feeds the other system. Right. So, so that concept that we, we often use in the addiction world, the opposite of addiction is connection. This is yeah. just feeding that whole it, it, uh, concept. Yeah. yeah, it is exactly the same. It's just that you, the connection is a little bit limited when you think of it. It's as if it's connected to a human. I think that's that's true. But you can also increase this feeling by increasing the the uh, the contact feeling of contact with a slight pressure. Mm-hmm. I wonder, you know, if these, you know, it's very popular now in Sweden with these blankets. With, oh, yes. with, a lot, with with some weight yeah. and, and you you sleep better and and there are lots of good things i i wonder if you don't have a little bit you could also enhance you know the tone this positive aspect of the oxytocin system by that so the important thing is not just not just relationships but increasing yeah. the, the touch receptors the warmth yeah. I now, think what is about, important. You, you, you've been instrumental in some of the pharmaceutical development, I understand, uh, like the intranasal oxytocin. Uh, can you comment on that? Is that a solution? Can we actually uh, act, um, become a act, kinder, act, gentler act, nation with a few squirts of this stuff every day? <laughs> actually, I haven't worked with the intranasal. I worked with another uh, form. I worked with a gel, oh, okay. which, you, which, which we can use during menopause. But my feeling wow, is, yes. yeah, but my feeling is that the intranasal is not as good as stimulating your own oxytocin because the intranasal, oh, you don't really know where it goes. It uh-huh. might, and you know, if you look at the, all the effects of oxytocin, it can, depending on the situation, go in that direction or that direction. But if you stimulate it by your own activating your own nerves, it will go exactly where you want it, you know. So I think that, yes, the intranasal may help to a certain degree, but you will not get the deep sense of relaxation. We don't see that, actually. You don't see the real lowering of cortisol or blood pressure or, or pain relief, a little bit, but not the full effect. So would can you, you get it from yourself? Yeah, it, yeah it wouldn't be a good solution to food addiction to pr- prescribe that, for example, at least not at this stage. I don't think so, but there are some studies, but I don't, haven't seen them replicated. Well, you do get a little bit of okay, little reduction, bit. a little bit of tell satiety, us, yeah, but not so tell much. Tell us about the gel, because uh, and and how does uh, how does menopause uh, cause a problem? Like how, what 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 happens with menopause, and how does the gel work? Well, the gel is working. Actually, by by uh, it's it, you, it's a local gel. You put it into the vagina, okay. and then you will have some, you know, oxytocin being absorbed, and you will have these effects in a very very interesting way. In addition to within within two days or one week, you know, during menopause, the levels, the number of cells in the in the vaginal mucosa is decreased from twelve to two mm. in one week. That's normalized with the oxytocin gel. Ah. 
And then we are really to the core of the effects of oxytocin. It is actually not only, you know, stimulating uh, reproduction in the big sense, it's also stimulating reproduction of cells, you know. So it sort of heals. So this is a more basic effect of oxytocin. But since it leaks a bit, you also get these other effects. And in animal experiments, we did see that if you gave the animals oxytocin during menopause, you had an enormous effect on, on uh, they lost weight and they, uh, you know, got a little bit more active. They, they, they felt more better because you also have to think when you give oxytocin or think of oxytocin, the pattern of effect differs if you have the normal estrogen levels, you know, the, during fertile part of your life or during menopause. So when you lose your estrogen, oxytocin becomes even more important because it's substituting part for the estrogen. Right. And it may be part of the explanation if a person's already deficient for why menopause can be so difficult for some women. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. So, so now, now tell me, is it true that eight hugs a day can make the difference? That would be equivalent to a oxytocin medication. I think that I have to eight hugs. I think that I tell you, we, we made a we study. Need? What do we need? Uh, we need a few hugs. But, you know, if, if you have a person close to you, you will probably get the oxytocin condition. So it's good to have somebody, you know, in your, you know, in your close to where you live. But remember, there are people who don't like touch uh-huh. because they are afraid of it. Or they may even have some kind of dysfunction, dysfunctional wiring of the touch system, you know, like autistic individuals and things. Yes. But they may respond positively to animals because mm-hmm. they are somehow not so tr- triggered by this. And we also know that the, the deep touch is still there. So they very often like, you know, to, to uh, have the pressure and they can really profit from that. But I'm not sure that a hug is enough unless it's a really, you know, real hug. And yeah. then it, it, I'm sure it helps. I think a lot of people have a lot of help of that. But I also think that especially in the winter, when it's dark, this is also a period of imbalance. I think at least, I don't know, where where do you live? in? Well, we live in different places. I live in in Toronto, which is, and Molly, you live in Montana. Yeah, very Uh, similar, though, to Sweden, both places that where we live, very uh, similar. Yeah, Yeah. but is is it as dark in the winter? I don't so think we so. we just have five or six hours of daylight, five dark. No, no, no. And that's we probably superior. get a little bit more, but yeah. yeah. yeah uh, so I think that this it triggers some kind of hibernation or something where you also lose yeah. some of your positive energy. So things get worse in the winter, I think, very often because of this uh, adaptation to, to the environment. I think we shouldn't forget that, that it's, it's, it's a kind of a depression, but not a real depression. It's a down regulation of of uh, energy to to uh, which is long it's it's a remnants of a very old system i think it is okay so, so, so mm, oh, sorry sorry now go on so your your sort of general thesis in terms of disordered eating is that, that there's an imbalance that's happening between satiety and hunger and that oxytocin yeah. plays a role that we that has been neglected yes so so has there been any in terms of this contribution to eating and I, I think it's essential that we bring this out Baldi and I and mm-hmm. food junkies mm-hmm. and all the people in this field uh, because I'm sure that it's a huge role in food addiction but have you had any uh what's been the general response from the medical community has it been embracing of your idea or has there been pushback what's where well, where are you with that that's a very good question in the beginning when I started to talk about oxytocin I left everything I had done you know mm. I started with oxytocin then People would look at me as if I were crazy or something. But not today. I think I think everybody talks about oxytocin now. You know, the behavioral effects became a little bit too popular because it was the love hormone and connection yes. and everything. It's so easy, you know, and it was a fantastic theme for the journalists. But I was really more interested in these very basic effects, you know, the calming and, and all these things. And but that's coming now, and it's it's. Uh, I don't think people are, are disbelieving it anymore. But it's complex. You need to know a lot to be able to use this knowledge. And then there is another aspect that I would like to bring up, and that is that there has been a disconnect 
between all this old knowledge about physiology, you know, and the GI tract and, and hunger and, and satiety yes. and, and the new new research where they always sort of, it, it's more linked to, to uh, being, uh, you know, eating too much because it's so pleasurable. And that's just one part of it. It's, it, it belongs together. You know, the, the satiety system, which is here, and, and the system link, linked to well-being and hunger and the dopamine system, reward system, they, they belong together somehow. And before it was just the physiology of the GI tract, and now they only talk about being dependent on sugar and these things. And I'm sure it's just one aspect of being sensitive to low blood sugar or high blood sugar, whatever. I don't know exactly, but I think it must belong together should be part of the same system that's dysregulated. And there are different aspects of this. Okay. And so so the if, if I wanted to have a summary for our listeners in terms of what what can we use from this information, it would be essentially in this this dysregulation or or lack of balance, one of the things that we need to do, aside from eating more protein and fat, is uh, find ways to get natural oxytocin so that our hunger for closeness can actually be achieved the way it should be, which is through touch. Uh, yeah, which will automatically decrease the the hunger, uh, the hunger system. Yeah. But I would say it's the same system that's activated by the food in the stomach. It's the same, you know. It it ends yeah. up in the oxytocin system. Both of them, both the the protein and the fat and the and the vagal nerve and the other one. But it's somewhere there is a weakness or or. A, depending on something. And therefore, we have to reinforce the, this input and, and uh, with all the, the uh, tools we have. Yes. But it makes sense, all of this. You know, lactobacilli is one yes. of many I, that I, by I, which I, you can activate the vagal nerve. It's not wrong, but it's definitely not the full story. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, well, hot tubs, massage. Uh, uh, massage, oh, and the pets and the hot water and, and the bath and swimming and, and yeah. being in the med you know, uh, sunbathing, everything of these things that make you feel good. Don't forget the physical contact. You don't always need a person there. It could also be, I mean, non-personal systems that help you with this. Maybe, maybe these blankets, you know, with some weight in it. I wouldn't be surprised because it does make you sleep better. <laughs> and 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 uh, and uh, it, it activates your calming systems. So uh, I think so. Uh, you, many you, many different ways. Have I you tried I haven't, those? Sounds like well, you have. My, my children, my children have them, and I have, in fact, tried a few times. And I, I think, I think it was fine. I haven't come to the to the decision to buy one myself, but I might do. I might do. <laughs> Really. And then, of course, social company all the time. It's, it also adds to this. I think also, and, and avoiding, avoiding stress would probably be important too, you know, because that would, the, the balance here is easily shaken. And avoiding starvation and all these things that would also sort of help the negative system a little bit too much. Right. Or eating, yeah. eating too little, too few yeah. calories. I'm sure there is a balance where the body starts to reckon, oh, there's something coming. Actually, we made a study in, in uh, lactating rats, and they were eating fully, you know. And, and then we took away the little aspect of the vagal nerve that's in giving information from the CCK up to the brain. Yeah. And within a few days, there was no oxytocin left. And these, these rats continued to eat too much because they were lactating, but they didn't give any milk. So they lost the ability to give out, you know, mm -hmm. and they became quite aggressive. So I think this input is extremely important also from, from this area. You know, I don't want to get into this topic for too long, but I just can't help but say it, this would be a reason why for some people intermittent fasting or restricted eating would not be a good idea. If, if I agree. I yeah. agree. I think that's a, that's a trigger. Yeah. To, to 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 the imbalance to break out into to to behaviors that you can't control of course because yeah. all these things i'm talking about it's not conscious it is acting at lower levels of the yeah. brain because they are not there 
they were created long before. I mean, the cortex was linked to it. It would explain why some people can do that kind of practice with with no no consequences, and others simply cannot. Because, exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. That's, that's we are different. We are different. Yeah. I think we have to to also accept that some people are sensitive and some people are not. And 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 but basically, it's about imbalance here, and and that can be this balance can at least be helped a bit to be less uh, dangerous or less uh, harming, I would say. Oh, can you believe that this hour has already flown by and I could no, listen to you I can't. too. I know I could <laughs> listen to you too. Go back and forth, go back and forth. We just appreciate your time so much. And before you go though, we have a couple questions for you. Uh, mm-hmm. First, we always like to know what's next. What's next for you? Is there another book? You you mentioned briefly you're involved in some research. What mm-hmm. can we look forward to? For the moment, I think my my focus is actually I'm I'm working with a group on on um, you know where we try to study the consequences of different kinds of birth because we think uh-huh. that one of the reasons by why you know by why we have such an change right now could be also that that we manipulate things which are highly biological and therefore reason that's what's happening you know during birth and breastfeeding and all that that's one aspect the other one is that i'm extremely triggered by these menopausal effects and uh, would be very happy to try to create some kind of a menopausal remedy with is estrogen free but mm. still has all these positive effects because I think it, it's something that I would like to try myself. I also write a book right now on, on uh, actually the, the role of oxytocin in, in parenting. Now that the fathers are being involved, everything is a little bit upset also, you know. And, and then I would like to write one on, on uh, uh, manual therapies, you know. I think they are doing such a fantastic work, all these people working with different kinds of massage. I don't, and they need re- the reinforcement of having the mechanism by which they're working clarified to everybody because it's not just a massage, it's activating the oxytocin system. And that's so extremely important, the work they do. I couldn't agree more. I actually just came from a massage this morning mm-hmm. right before our mm-hmm. interview. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've had to learn over the years to schedule them on a regular mm-hmm. type basis. Oh yeah, but, but you don't need... I mean, if if you if you have a few massages in the beginning, you wouldn't need so often anymore because you get right. up to a level where you have some kind of a, and then you need to boost it. Of course, yeah. but you don't need, you don't need it as much after a while. Yeah, because you you train the system somehow. That's, that's like saying one dog might be enough, but that doesn't mean you need to get six. One might <laughs> no, <be enough>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's maybe five too many there. All right. Yeah. So our final question is our signature mm-hmm. question. I'm going to make it, I'm going to adjust it. So it's uh, personal to you. If you could tell a younger version of yourself something about the role of oxytocin and how important it would be to pay attention to, what might that be? I would try, to, I would say that it is not only, in, you know, if you lead, read and listen to all these coaches, they always talk about reduction of stress. And they don't, I think, discuss activation of this anti-stress system enough because you can do it with mental things too. I mean, mindfulness and relaxation therapies, they also go into the same final pathway. This is, decre- you know, the oxytocin system, which is antagonizing stress and all these things. So I would, of course, advise them to, to, to train these systems earlier. I do think that... It's a bit unfortunate with too much uh, computer games and, and telephone, you know, looking at the telephone because it doesn't give you the full reward. You know, if you talk to somebody, you hear the voice, you look at the eyes. But when you look at the screen, take away half of the positive information. Yes. So I think they lose something there. And that makes the need for the extra positive input even stronger. And uh, they need to learn these things early. And sleep well and and have your friends and don't look too much at the screens. Not because I think it's dangerous in a sense, but it deprives you of the time that you would need re- would re- have reinforcement. I think actually physical activity also reinforces. I mean, 
when you run or whatever you do, you have a temporal or temporary rise of your stress levels. But after that, remember, you have this decrease in blood pressure and all this. That's because the oxytocin system kicks in to repair, so to say. So that's another way to get to these uh, positive effects. Move. Wow. I think that's very important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, I really shouldn't uh, interrupt in this way because we're closing up, but just to, just to share that as a physician using Zoom, you know, the, in, the, the doctor-patient relationship is so important. And with mm. Zoom, I found it's a two-dimensional, it's not three-dimensional, and it's just mm. not the same. So I, It I isn't really the same. Echo. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, it it is not it's not without effect. It's not, but that no, isn't the full. I don't think full. you get the get in tune in exactly yeah. the same way yeah. as you do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So anyway, mm-hmm. Thank you so much for spending the time uh, to talk to us. I think this is a really important and so interesting topic around food. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to uh, talk to people who are interested and who have relevant questions. Because that <laughs> makes me think further and to, to go on in my oh, way of you. thinking and working. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.